Hello everyone, welcome to Desert Island Comics. This is the latest in a series of videos featuring guests at the Lakes International Comic Art Festival who are from the world of comics and are talking about examples of the medium they'd like to have with them if they were marooned on a desert island. I'm broadcast journalist Alex Fitch and it is my great pleasure to welcome as our would-be Robinson Crusoe writer Greg Rucker. Greg realise... Sorry, yeah. go on. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Introduction to get through. I was okay. going to say, you, re you realize the odds of survival are very, very low. Uh -huh. well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, you could sneak some safety, uh, like life advice into some of the comics, how to build a shelter, you know, how yeah, to gut fish, you know. I suppose if I was smarter, yeah, I, I <laughs> entirely on the basis of surviving. <laughs> right. but let, let, carry on just, as you were big, yeah I'll big you up a bit um, <laughs> it's my great pleasure to welcome as I would be Robinson Crusoe writer Greg Rucker Greg has written novels, comic books and more recently has written for the screen adapting his comic The Old Guard for Netflix as a comics writer he co-created the modern version of Batwoman Kate Kane and in chronicling her adventures in detective comics, he won a Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation Media Award for this work. He's also won a Harvey Award and numerous Eisners for his work in comics, and it's an honour to be talking to him today about his favourite examples of sequential art. <laughs> Thank you. That is very, very nice. I feel I should, um, I feel I should sort of begin by saying... Um, I am very sorry I will not actually be able to attend the Lakes Festival this year. I'm hoping I'll be able to make it next year. So I said in the introduction, uh, you'll be talking about your favourite comics. I say that, but do you make a distinction between what are your absolute favourite examples of the genre and the four titles or runs that you would actually be want to, to have with you in perpetuity, as it were, when you're marooned in the middle of the ocean? Um, <laughs> presuming I were to survive. <laughs> um the the five collections and 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 i cheated because you've got to figure this is at least 20 all total like with the bonus items and so on it's probably in the neighborhood of 50 pounds of books yeah. um so presuming that you know i was able to provide for myself in the you know forms of food shelter water things like that these are things that i would be happy to read over and over again Nice. Um, I don't know if they are the best that the medium can offer. They are absolutely a Western centric um, selection. They are based on my personal relationship with the books mm. and my personal relationship with most comics extends uh, uh is mostly north american and european i am not as well versed in manga for instance and i am sure you know for sheer reading uh material all of death note would have been good right just to keep yeah, you yeah. going and things like yeah, that yeah, yeah. but i am not and and i admit this it is it is a large blind spot in my um in my comics education so my choices were very much based on comfort um admiration uh and and as i said my emotional relationship to the works so, mm. so well i read on wikipedia so i don't know how true it is uh your first encounter with comics which started your love of the medium was as a five-year-old in a market you found one of the black and white digest versions of the incredible hulk yeah, I must have been about that age. Where I grew up, I don't know how, how uh, if there is um, if there is anything uh, similar in in, in England. Um, I grew up in a, a farming community on on the central coast of California, and I would go to the market with my mom. And in the checkout line, there were the point of sale items, and there were for a while these little digest reprints of Archie and Jughead and things like that you know and there were these little reprints of the Lee Kirby early like literally like here's the first five issues of Fantastic Four in tiny black and white and I remember distinctly 
you know, just being desperate for, for those and, 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 and spending. And I was, you know, like most writers, I was a precocious reader. Um, I was reading early and I was reading above my level. Um, and in, in large part, that was because when I would beg for sugar cereal or a candy bar, my mother would uh, turn such a scornful eye on me. I, I would regret having spoken for days. But if I asked for a book, nine <laughs> times out of 10, I'd get it. Mm. And my mom, either because of my age or simply because she didn't have a prejudice to the medium, would indulge that. So I, I distinctly remember getting, you know, a couple of these things. And, and the Hulk was one of them. And the Hulk was significant in my life because my older sister has Down syndrome. Mm. And I'm, um, I'm of an age where when I was very young, you know, Wonder Woman was still, Linda Carter as Wonder Woman was still on TV. Uh, Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno were the Incredible Hulk. And my sister loved the Incredible Hulk. Um, cognitively understood that these, you know, in the show, these were the same person. That there was this very tender, caring, nice, gentle human being who in the face of a threat to another would turn into this great green powerful monster that would never hurt anybody but the but the evildoer mm. and uh so the hulk actually factored pretty prominently like i knew the hulk before i knew anything else about marvel really a, mm. as a result of that and one of the first major comics purchases I made, meaning that as opposed to begging my mom on hands and knees, can I have this digest, was walking into a comic book store in Monterey, California, um, and picking up a copy of the Incredible Hulk magazine, the stories by Doug Mensch. Mm. Um, and there was a lead Hulk story and then a backup Moon Knight story. And I picked that up thinking I would share it with my sister, who had no interest in it at all. I mean, just not. <laughs> But I took that thing to school with me and I read it to pieces. Literally, the cover came off. And I, I have um, very acute memories of instead of doing schoolwork, sitting there at my desk, trying to copy the panels um, and failing dismally. It was, it, was, it was the moment I realized I can't draw. Um, <laughs> so Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um uh, and, and also, I mean, I guess at that time, you know, you said that your um, sister had Downs and the Hulk was important to her. In terms of the media in general, um, it was those TV versions of Marvel superheroes, I guess, that were far more embedded in the public consciousness than the oh, comic yeah. book ones. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't really encounter comic books as something that you uh, collected and read until I got... Uh, I, I would have been about 13. Uh, I was starting high school in the U.S. So, mm. And I fell in with a group of kids at this school who were all uh, Marvel zombies. Mm. And so I would go with them to the comic book store and, and got sort of my gateway drug was uh, Uncanny X-Men because mm. that was their book. And that was the collective book. And I came in at just the right time because at that point, then I started digging around in these stores and finding, you know, discovering on my own. And, and, and I remember, for instance, the revelatory moment after, I don't know, a year or two of being in the comics of picking up the Miller Mazzucchelli um, Daredevil run mm. and, and recognizing it as significantly and importantly different in the medium at that time. Mm. Um, you know, and then as through high school, that's the era where you get Dark Knight Returns, that's where you get Longbow Hunters, that's where you get Watchmen. Mm. Um, those are all the books of sort of my coming of age. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's running into Kimiko, it's discovering Fish Police, it's discovering uh, Grendel, um and that carries me into my first few years of college mm. um and that leads to 
Neil Gaiman, right? It leads to Sandman, but significantly it leads rather nicely, I think, to the first book on my list, which is the Denny O'Neill, Dennis Cohen um, reinterpretation of Ditko's The Question. Nice. Uh, and that book had a profound impact on me. Mm. Um, I think in the, you'll notice i'm an easy interview because i just go so, so, feel, so feel free to say greg shut up now i, I have a question. no not at all i mean for the purpose for the purpose of editing i don't know if they might like me to say so greg what's the first choice in your uh, selection let me tell you the first choice in my collection which we have segued <laughs> into uh is the denny o'neill dennis cohen reinterpretation of the question and so there are two things going on there I, mean, I remember being drawn to it because of the Sinkevich cover to issue one, which is this mm. lovely film noir homage cover. Um, and it's beautiful. And I had known Sinkevich's work because of New Mutants, right? Coming out of the Marvel zombie phase and Uncanny mm. X-Men. And so that's on one half, right? It was just, what the hell is this? I am intrigued by this gorgeous cover. Then you read that first issue, um, which is a master class in how to write a first issue. It is not a unique um, narrative convention that Denny uses. Denny uses a convention that has been used before. You know, Vic Sage has 24 hours left to live, right? On mm. page one, panel one, right? <laughs> and, but that's propulsive. And so the narrative in and of itself is so incredibly skillful and beautifully done. And the art was so dynamic. And one of the things that I've always loved about Cohen's art and series and I have tried over and over in my career to uh, encourage uh, my collaborators to embrace this in certain books. Um, Cully Hamner does a great job of it, by the way, mm. which is Cohen's, um, the fights look like, and, and this was because of Cohen's own martial arts experience, but they don't, they're not comic book fights. They're not these great big, here's a wildly swinging punch and then somebody ah, they go flying <laughs> off of the panel there there is a logical causality of the moves mm. and an efficiency in them that was very tactile and actually has the added effect of really taking what is effectively a superhero story mm. guy in a mask and grounding it in a very visceral way so that when Vic, quote unquote, dies at the end of the first issue. Um, it is absolutely plausible, as it is plausible at the start of the second issue that he survives. Mm. So, so that's on one hand, right? On the other hand, and this runs through all my writing, I respond really, really well to media, entertainment that can successfully um, keep your attention over here with the shiny, exciting thing <laughs> while over here slipping in the more serious or profound or um, I, I don't want to say worthy. I should suppose I say more complex ideas. Like one of my favorite movies is Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is nothing but a chase film right it is a guy trying to get the MacGuffin away from the nazis and it is lots of fun but it's also the story of two men fighting over the soul of one woman mm. and yeah. there is a viewing of that film where every single choice look at the usage of light in the movie look at the first reveal of Indy when he is completely in shadow and steps only half in the light, this mm. is a guy who's not a good guy. <laughs> and we learn pretty quickly in the movie, he's actually not. He's actually a pretty rotten human being. Mm. And his 
arc, right, the redemptive arc that Indy has culminates in quite literally him recognizing his sin and knowing he is unworthy to look on the face of God, mm. you know? The, the moment of realization of don't look at it, Marion, because we're not worthy to. Mm. Um, so I love it when media does that. And what Denny did was take a character concept who, frankly, if you read the early question stories, they're not great. They're all polemics. Mm. And they're Randian. They're Ayn Randian polemics, which is a political stance I have no patience and tolerance for. Mm. Um, well, that's why and... I think, you know, the whole kind of Marvel method where like Ditko and Lee's Spider-Man is terrific because it's two people working together. But then when you get to the question and, you know, Ditko is bringing some of his own politics into it as continues throughout the his work for the rest of his career it becomes more problematic you can still see there's great art but without someone supplying great ideas it's not as yeah. amazing a comic well and 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 look a polemic is I, I, if you pick up a comic book and you are getting lectured mm. you put down the comic book and i say this as somebody whose writing is avowedly and unashamedly political <laughs> right but if I am not entertaining you, then my politics, are, all I'm going to do is, is say either agree with me or leave. Mm. And that's no fun. And, and, and I'm not interested in that either. So one of the things that I think that I love and, and that I realized in, in reading Denny's question is that he was taking these ideas and really interrogating them. I mean, the first 12 if not 24 issues are an interrogation of uh, 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 of how we define sanity mm. um and it comes down to charlie's name right vic sage is renamed by denny o'neill charles victor zaz and if you're a batman fan you recognize the zaz name yeah but but the zaz in batman is it, it, is taken incorrectly from the writings of Zaz, hmm. who is best known for a work called The Myth of Mental Illness, which argues that there is actually no such thing as mental illness. There is only behavior society deems unacceptable, un, uh, unacceptable hmm. in such a way that it says, well, this is broken behavior. It's mm -hmm. so unacceptable as to be outside of what we think of as good and normal thought. Mm. So you've got Denny quite late. You don't name the character that, right? And not be actively turning into it. Mm. And then to tie that with Denny's own experiences as he is coming through these lifestyle changes. You know, he's had this heart attack. He is not drinking. He is really embracing uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern medicine, Eastern thought. Mm. Um, and you get what I think is just this remarkable and magical collaboration. And that goes to, and then I will shut up about this first book because I just remember it. <laughs> Second, but that goes to one of the things that I think makes comics in part one of the things that for me makes comics so magical mm. which is the collaboration as i said earlier i can't draw so there is no comic unless i am collaborating with somebody who can mm. and in the best of those collaborations you end up with something that is more than the sum of its parts and i have been blessed in my career on more than one occasion to work with artists and editors of such a caliber that they elevate what I think is in the main, my pedestrian writing to, to <laughs> some, to something that is genuinely, mm. if not, if not good, I mean, genuinely worthy. There are a couple of stories. I don't have many of them, but there, there are a couple of stories that I would stand up against almost anything in the medium that I've written yeah. and say, this is as good as this is as worthy as, and that is 
and that's not me. That's me in the collaboration. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, I, I wonder if there's a point in all comic writers' careers that no matter how good their work is in general, and I think a lot of people would agree, you know, you've written a lot of uh, terrific comics, but there's a run where you think this is actually transcending the medium in a certain kind of yeah. way where it's bringing a new voice. And I'm thinking of, and I've got a prop, uh, your... Uh, yeah, Ryan, uh, allergy. yeah. Batwoman with uh, J.H. Williams, just cause, you know, his art is absolutely fantastic. And it felt like the two of you working together were really kind of working to each other's strengths. One of the most, uh, one of the most complete collaborations. I think in that edition, like there are some script pages in the back, mm. and the script pages. It's almost embarrassing because I remember when it came out, and I was looking, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I mean, people read this, and they're going to think, "Wow, Rucka didn't do anything." <laughs> Jim and I would spend, and I am not exaggerating. Jim and I would spend in the neighborhood of 48 to 72 hours on the phone, not all at once, um, before I would even start writing a script. Um, it was so, there was so much dialogue, you know, mm. I would get on the phone and I would say, so this is what we're going to do in this issue. And Jim would come back and would say, you know, there's this visual I've always wanted to try. I've always wanted to try this thing. And I'd say, okay, you know, I, oh, I can figure out where to use that. Or I don't think we can do that here, but maybe here. And I would end up with notes and notes and notes and end up writing scripts. That, and most of my scripts run into the long because I tend to write full scripts. Mm. <clears throat> you know some of my scripts come up were in upwards of 50 pages even you know with with a lot of spacing for clarity but still they're, they're not they're not in substantial documents <laughs> and with jim it would quite literally be like pages eight and nine panels one through five jim this is that thing we talked about <laughs> nice. right and, and, and then it, and then i would have the dialogue for it and god bless michael seglane who was editing it who would get these scripts and be like well, I have no idea what that means, but I have faith it'll work. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, I worked that way. Working with Jim was, um, was, was a very pivotal moment. And I, I think it marks sort of two stages of my career. Mm. Um, because I came away from working with Jim <clears throat> basically refusing to not collaborate as fully as possible moving forward. And there are some artists I've worked with who don't actually want that kind of communication at all. Mm -hmm. There are some who want me on, <clears throat> on speed dial, you know, so they can, they can reach me whenever Michael Lark is, is, is a perfect example of that because Michael's and Mike, communication on Lazarus is such that mm. I know if there's any question he's going to ask and and we and and further he's going to interrogate the hell out of me mm. you know why are you making this choice is this what you want um but when I came into comics there was I, I came into comics at a point where you didn't you couldn't email a script there it just wasn't an option mm. you printed out your script and you put it in a DHL envelope with your voucher and you sent it to, to DC mm. and then DC forwarded it to the artist. There was a wall between wow. you and whoever was drawing the book. Hmm. And, 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 and it was not an easy wall to scale. If you wanted to say, I'd like to talk to whoever is drawing this, you would actually get some pushback. Hmm. There was a real fear that if an artist and a writer weren't getting along, it would disrupt the publication schedule to such an extent you would have real problems, I think. Mm. And it wasn't really until working with Jim where I was, the, and, and also the, the, the medium and the business had changed, but it was really working with Jim where I was like, I'm never going back. I'm never mm. going back. I don't ever, ever want to send a script to an artist and not know who that person is and mm. it's sort of sad to realize i was that's you know 10 years into my career before i hit that point and i look yeah. back and i go wow these 
there's a lot of early work that could have been so much better. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> long, long, long answers. <laughs> you uh, mentioned the question uh, as your first choice, and we're talking yeah. about how it's a very grounded comic and based on reality. Uh, your second choice is then the exact opposite. Could you talk about that, please? <laughs> because I, 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 I love. Arthur stories. I love mm. the Arthurian cycle and, and the mythology of it. And I love it in all of its forms. It, it appears twice on this list in all, in all sincerity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when, when I found Camelot 3000, um, oh my God. You know, I mean, it was like, this is, this is perfect. And I had never seen also, you know, I'm talking about Boland's art. Mm. Never mind the writing right just Boland's art is always Brian Boland's art and it is lavish and lush and delicious and I was this is one of those early books for me right this is a book that I encountered fairly early and it was another one of these the scales fall away from my eyes moment of what can be done in comics mm. this wasn't a superhero story it's a fantasy story, absolutely. But I hadn't picked up a story like that. That was the first time because comics up until that point in large part had been either superheroes or Archie, right? And then mm -hmm. every now and then something really oddball would come in, sort of underground. Mm. But to see Camelot 3000 was to see something familiar, the Arthurian mythos mm. being done in an interpretation that i thought was certainly at the time exciting and inventive and and and, and, and unique and mm. yeah it, it is and you know i'll be honest to say i haven't gone back and reread it in a while and i kind of don't want to because i don't want to have i'm 51 now i don't want to find out that it's not as good as i remember <laughs> i don't want to disappoint myself yeah um i mean i think i last read it maybe about 10 years ago and i think still enjoyed it but but yeah. like you say these things particularly and actually i think you know i read it uh in the 80s as well that uh you know comics that I associate with my childhood uh, obviously have a, an element of nostalgia about them too. And you then worry in later life that something you put on a pedestal when you're young is something that as an adult you think, oh God, this is a bit tacky. It's not nearly as sophisticated as I thought it was when I was young. Well, and that's absolutely it. it, it yeah. and, and there's nothing wrong with us becoming more sophisticated. It is, it, it's recognizing that intellectual versus the emotional attachment to the work. Mm. Um, but I think Camelot 3000 probably still stands up. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I, I mean, it just, it, it's, it was so important to me mm. having found it. And it was also, you know, it was also a little transgressive. It was a, a little bit adult, you know, it, 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 it it's, uh, it, the, the whole Tristan and Assault uh a story within it is a very very you know i mean on one view you look at it and you go like wow okay that's very male gazy servicey mm -hmm. but on another it's like that's pretty bold considering the time i mean you're talking to a guy who had to you know fight to have renee montoya come out of the closet in 2003 mm -hmm. uh, I, you know i have two kids and mm -hmm. For them, they're, the idea of a world where you had to be in the closet is alien. Yeah. And they're fortunate that they have come into a world, and I mean specifically a culture and a place, because we both, you know, we know there are places in the world where it's still the case, and you take your life into your hands if you say, no, I love another man. Um, but... Yeah, I, it was, and, and considering my own, you know, avowed and obvious, if you, you read my Uber, you know, oh, I can't believe I just referred to my own works as Uber. Um, 
that was really pompous. I apologize. <laughs> You're allowed. You, you read my stuff and you can see I've always been interested in gender politics and issues of sexuality and gender identity. Mm. Um, and there's a whole other discussion to be had as to how I get there and why and what I'm trying to answer or interrogate. But I'm certain that Camelot 3000 fed into that as well. Mm. You know, um, so yeah, I, I, I suspect now I will go back and revisit it probably this week as a result mm. of this conversation. But yeah, it, it was one of those books where I was like, I didn't know comics could be this. Mm. No. Nice. Uh, and indeed, your next choice is another fantasy epic that's been updated to, at the time, <laughs> modern audiences who are into comics. And it is. It is The Mage Cycle by Matt Wagner. Um, and this is all three of uh, uh, because I'm taking a lot of reading material uh, sure. for this. I, th I think we can assume that you were moving these 50 pounds of comics. Yeah, it was the ship was actually I was on my way to Australia yeah. when it was it's down. in a, a watertight. Yeah, that, that was what I pot. clung to exactly as I yeah. as I as I got washed <laughs> up on the say toll um, <laughs> that and one packet of crisps. Um, the uh, and again, it's another Arthurian, in a way, pastiche because mm. what what Wagner is doing is, you know, what where Matchstick is 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 very much Arthur, um, and 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 is surrounded by uh, Arthurian analogs, um, you know, and Edsel and so on. Um, as the cycle expands out to incorporate broader heroic mythology, more global heroic mythology, um, it becomes to me a very, again, this is one of those books where I picked it up and I was like, this is amazing and this is different and I'd never seen anything like it. And his art is just unbelievable. But Matt trying to and and I and I and I call him Matt because I know him. <laughs> but um, he, he, the way he is trying to both sort of celebrate and deconstruct the completeness of these mythological cycles, mm. right? It, it, it is very much Matt Wagner sick, sitting down and saying, "I'm going to write my own mythological cycle. It's going to have the rise." and the apex and the fall by necessity. Mm. And one can argue about the quality uh, uh, of the concluding work, I suppose, if one were so inclined, one can do that with anything. But as a complete work, um, it is one that I can return to over and over again. Mm. And I also like it because it is quite literally watching Wagner write this thing over the course of his life, which is not to say his life is over at all. But the <laughs> but but if you were to talk to if you were to talk to Matt about it, there is a reason that there are, you know, this is a decades-long project because he is starting in the young man place that Kevin is in, mm. is moving into this you know, early middle age place. And now, you know, he's, he may well be a grandfather now. Mm. Um, so so do, you, do you get the impression yeah. then when you talk to him about it, that he actually left uh, his return to the title until later life because he wanted to have that life experience and then bring it to the page? Yeah, I'm not sure he would articulate it that, uh, that precisely. But I will almost guarantee you that were you to ask Matt, why did it take so long between um, the last two? His answer would be, I wasn't ready yet. Mm. And that's not an answer saying, I didn't have time or I didn't have the skill. That's him saying, I was not in a place in head and heart to create that piece of work. Um, so I do, I think it was very deliberate, very mm. deliberate. Yeah. And it's interesting that when you compare those two works, 
Camelot 3000 very much feels like they're taking Arthurian legends and just bringing them into a modern setting, while yeah. uh, Wagner with Mage is taking some of those kind of mythological uh, and Arthurian legends and just thinking actually about the structure and how they tell the human experience as well, and then using that as a starting point for his own interpretation of the work. Yeah, very much. I mean, I think if you look at Camelot 3000, is, is it, 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 in its rudest form, it is a retelling of the Arthurian, or, or Arthurian mythos. That's mm -hmm. all that is. If you look at Mage, there is an interrogation. We are springing off of this mythological cycle to talk about the nature of these myths mm. and, and how they, and, and that builds out into how do these myths embody themselves in our modern world. Mm. Um, I hadn't realized when I made the list, but I mean, that, that would be my reading order, right? It would be read Camelot 3000 first and then read, read the mage books and you'll see how these feed. And mm. it's interesting that they are happening somewhat concurrently, mm. right? Like Mage the Hero Discovered and Camelot 3000, I do not believe there's a huge gap between the public publication dates that something is going on for both Barr and Wagner mm. where they're circling around Arthur. And, you know, it may be that they both came out of Borman's Excalibur going like, I got to use that. Yeah. Um, or any other number of things. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do not think like if I were the if I were a doctor, doctoral student looking at the evolution of these comics in the 80s or whatnot, I would absolutely be like, hmm, what's going on here in this moment in time that these mm -hmm. artists are both sort of gravitating to the same ideas in the same well moment. And also, I mean, I guess it's also a genre thing that you spoke about how you hadn't come across many fantasy comics. And I think, um, I mean, I was only knee high at the time, but I think if you went into a comic shop in the early 80s and were looking for fantasy titles, there'd be Conan and there'd be Heavy Metal, and that would be about it. And, and then all of a the sudden... Books, you know, those were the books that weren't for us, right? Those were, exactly. Exactly. Those were, the, those were the transgressive books, right? Yeah. You didn't want to be caught looking at heavy metal yeah uh, if you weren't old enough for a given value of whatever old enough is right sure. but you know i remember picking up epic magazine and oh my god there was a nipple <laughs> and and it feeling dangerous in a really good way your next choice uh out of the list in some yeah. ways, on the face of it, um, is the most traditional superhero comic. But at the same time, it's also quite experimental. And we're talking about... Oh, right, right. I, 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 that's my cue. We're talking yeah. about uh, <laughs> Matt Fraction and, and David Aya's uh, Hawkeye Run. Mm. Um, so this is on there for a <laughs> couple of reasons. The first is, um, the first is Matt, whether he knows it or not, is one of my best friends. <laughs> um, he is such a dear man and I admire and respect him so very much. Mm. And if I were to be alone on a desert island without my friends, um, having a piece of Matt Fraction's genius um, and his humor mm. uh, and his ferocity and his passion and his anger um, would be of great comfort to me. That's one. Mm. Two, they're fun comics. They're unabashedly, delightedly, wonderfully fun. <laughs> Three, Matt and I, and we have talked about this before, are very different writers. We approach the whole act <clears throat> of writing a comic from completely different poles. Um, I would love actually to do a book with him at some point because 
it would either be amazing or it would be catastrophic. <laughs> it is one of those things where we look at each other and quite literally go, I do not know how you do the thing you do. Mm. Um, almost any writer I can read and I know how they do the thing they do. Right. Yeah. And that is not to malign them in any way, shape, or form. It is simply to say, from one plumber to another plumber, I know how you are hooking up that house, right? Mm -hmm. And then here comes Matt Fraction, who says, you know, actually, you can do it with magnets. <laughs> um, and I'm sitting here going, no, you can't. You cannot do it. It's not possible to do it with magnets, Matt. And he's like, yeah, watch it. Hold my beer. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he does it over and over and over. Oh, mm. Mm. he is one of the and I don't think people I, I'm not sure people understand this about him like and, and 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 he's not unique my wife writes in much the same manner but it, it but again in a different methodology but that is one of the most you do not get those books without laser-like precision mm. okay there is so much control of his craft and talent and skill set. There is such an understanding of the medium, mm. such an understanding of the page. He, I, 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 as I say, I don't know how he does it. I am and I've always been an intuitive writer. I'm a pretty good teacher because I'm a passionate teacher and I can convey my ideas, but I am also not the best teacher if you're going to go, well, structurally, how do you do this? Because I've always been an intuitive writer, mm. right? And this is one of the reasons why I think I'm, I'm a fairly adaptable writer is I can move from one medium to another to another. And mm. I can do so pretty deftly because uh, once I've understood the tools in the medium, um, I know when I'm going to need a hammer. But I cannot tell you in advance that I'm going to need the hammer. I mm. may need the flathead screwdriver or I mm. may need the three quarter inch socket wrench. I don't know. Mm. Right. But when I get there, I can reach for the tool and, and 99 times out of 100, it'll be the right tool. Sure. Um, Matt, Matt sets everything out like a surgeon mm. before he sets the work. I mean, his prep for the writing is unbelievable. And I have seen some of it, right? This is a guy who does two post-it notes, unspeakable things. Um, <laughs> and my head doesn't work like that. It never has. Mm. so all of this and 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 it is and this is not to say it is uh, in, in any way shape or form matt's best work because i don't actually think it is i would mm. argue that november is uh, a, a defining series of works mm. um but the collaboration with david the transition from narrative storytelling to graphic design storytelling mm. for lack of a better way to put it yeah uh combined with the wit combined with the fun combined with the joy of this absurdity in the marvel universe mm. i mean it is well you know, i mean we're talking about things that would make me feel happy and comfortable and that i could spend hours going over yeah, i can't yeah. i can think of i can think a few other books so Indeed. Well, and, you know, within that run of Hawkeye, an individual issue, which I think combines all of the things you're talking about, the wit, the storytelling, the graphic design, is one that I think is going to be talked about for years to come. And that's the issue where Pizza Dog is the focus yeah. of the issue. And we see the world from his point of view, which is to say all of these amazing little icons, which represent visually the smells that the dog is interpreting around the yeah. city and i think the only thing the only comic that's ever come close to that kind of storytelling i don't know if you know it is a graphic novel uh by woodrow phoenix called rumble strip 
uh, where he uses the language of the signage around a city to tell the story of the danger of uh, being killed by a motor car. But there it's, you know, it's very abstract. While with this issue of Hawkeye, uh, it feels that Fraction and Aya are taking the language of comics and doing something that's always just been slightly out of reach for your average brain, and then suddenly they flipped a switch and realized you can do this with comics. It is, it, it is I think, to the medium as important an issue as um, Morrison's um, Coyote Gospel. Mm, from Man right. Man, yeah. Yeah, and, and Coyote Gospel is nothing more than a Daffy Duck cartoon from the 40s. Indeed. You know, it, where, where we shattered the fourth wall, but it is, it is so, um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think you, we, that is an issue that is going to stand the test of time. Um, that is an issue that is going to be taught. Yeah. That is an issue that I am sure a dissertation has been written on already, <laughs> if not several. That, so. that, that is a comic that in my PhD, on architecture and comics i'm going to be looking at <laughs> and 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 well you should and like i say that's not the, and here's the thing of it if i had done that it would have been an inspired idea and accidental success but the collaboration between matt and david it goes to what i was saying before it is it is absolutely more than some of its parts Mm. That is a comic that only exists because those two are collaborating at that time. <clears throat> those two people come together and go, hey, we can do this. Mm. How do we do this? Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. And it is done again. But that, that issue doesn't work if every single one of the panels is not precise. Right? Yeah. If one of those is a wrong note, that whole story unravels. Um, that 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 book is a gen, gen, that issue in particular is a Jenga tower, mm. right? It, it, and and it stands, um, and it is magical, I think. And that's again, it, it, it's one of the things I love about the medium. It is when it works. Like a good comic's a good comic. It doesn't yeah. have to be magical to be a good comic. Sure. But a great comic is something that you never ever are able to put down it's always in your head mm. and that is absolutely one of them i think unquestionable so. yeah anybody who's read it and is hearing us knows exactly what we're talking about i mean they are seeing the panels in their mind's eye right now and that's what i mean and this is again not to malign any of the other books we've talked about but for those who know, for instance, Camelot 3000, when I say Camelot 3000, what is the iconic panel? What do you see? Right. The last one. And it, <laughs> right. And otherwise, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a bunch. Yeah. So we talk about Pizza Dog and everybody's like, I know, exactly. I'm right there with you. I'm right there yeah. with you. So, yeah. yeah. Although you're now making me think of an alien holding Excalibur, but anyway. <laughs> Not bad. Um, yeah. Your final choice um, yes. shows the kind of interest in British culture that has kind of come up uh, in our discussion. Um, <laughs> uh, and yet, well, and is, yet, is by American creators. It is an intensely personal choice because, again, I was thinking I am going to be on a deserted island by myself. Mm. Um, so I, I want a piece of Matt here. <laughs> um, the Hopeless Savages collection, right, that, that, that I cited, what, it's, its greatest hits, what, 2000 and something to 2010, mm. I think. Uh, is written by Jennifer Van Meter with a variety of collaborators, uh, Christine Nori and Meredith McLaren, and I want to say Andy Watson, and a lot of people are in there. Mm. Um, Jennifer Van Meter uh, and I have been married for 30 years um, and, and have made many books and two children and, 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 and have been through a lot together. And she is my everything 
and that's not to be sappy, but it is to say that I, I would, I would suffer without her. Mm. And if I'm going to be on a deserted island <laughs> without my wife, yeah. who is my best friend and my love, then having a piece of her humor and her kindness and her brilliance and her generosity of spirit with me uh, would probably be the thing that keeps me alive. Mm. I love the Hopeless Savages for a lot of reasons. And I recognize that when a husband talks about the artistic work of their spouse, it is presumed there is a bias. <laughs> that said, and acknowledging the bias, I think they're great books. Mm. I think they are fun and funny. I think they are humanist and honest and true. I think um, Zero is one of the greatest characters to have been created in the last 30 years in the medium. Mm. Uh, and I sincerely believe that. Um, this, this wild young woman who in any other interpretation is a manic pixie girl uh, with all of the negatives that that stereotype brings with it. Sure. And who in Hopeless Savages is, you know, this teenager moving into her adulthood, discovering, advocating for her own agency, you know, her own passion, the trials and tribulations, the conflicts with her parents. Mm. Um, I just, I, I think they are wonderful, wonderful stories. And they, you know, and, 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 and so much of Jen is in them. Mm. Um, and I will never, ever not laugh at lines that I read that uh, could have been said by our children at any point. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it wasn't me. It was probably Rat what did it. Um, you know, <laughs> um not a day is uh, not a day without drama <laughs> um so we've spoken about uh the importance of representation the importance of honesty great comics uh <laughs> how amazing creative teams work together but of course we now have to come to the most important topic what crisps and biscuits would you take to a desert island <laughs> okay so i was actually thinking about this last night because i knew you were gonna ask and i'm gonna cheat and I have to cheat because I have uh, diabetes. So um, I can't have crisps because they're just nothing but here's here. How many carbohydrates would you like? <laughs> I would like all of them, please. Well, here we've designed a fried form that'll do it. So mm. I, 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 I rarely get to enjoy a crisp. Um, and by the same token, uh, biscuits are... Uh, are, are viewed <clears throat> entirely on the basis of the ingredients. So my, my alternate uh, things that survived and happened to wash up was probably a container of uh, wasabi flavored walnuts, or not walnuts, almonds. The, yeah, the, okay. uh, Blue diamond wasabi almonds. Nice. I could do with. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually don't need... Um, anything on sort of the biscuit front because I'm going to presume that my island has at least one fruit bearing tree. Okay. Yeah. And I know it's not possible that it would be a stone fruit bearing tree in the tropics say, <laughs> but if it were a, a, a stone fruit tree, a uh, plum or nectarine or peach, I would be in seventh heaven. Nice. Um, I, I love me my stone fruits. Well, and maybe you could get thin slices of those stone fruits, dry them out in the sun, and you've basically, you go. you've got biscuits. There you are. <laughs> that would work. So there you are. Nice. And um, also in your ballast that you rescued from the ship. Yeah, there was uh, a whole other trunk that I thought was going to be like emergency supplies. 
and I cracked it open and instead it was all of my Terry Pratchett no novels in hardcover. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, uh, I, 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 I am never going to um, live down the shame of not having discovered Pratchett early enough to have met him. Because mm. I know for a fact there were shows we were at at the same time in the same place. Mm. And I had not read any Discworld. I met these two guys out of Australia uh, via Twitter several years ago. And um, they have since become dear friends. Uh, Robert McKenzie and, and Dave Walker, they're doing, um, they're, they're the writers of a comic that I am, for lack of a better phrase, producer on called Compass. Uh, last issue of which is going to be coming out. It's coming out from Image that I'm very proud of. It's drawn by Justin Greenwood. These are two really, really smart guys and we share a whole lot in common. And um, Robert is a huge Pratchett fan. And it basically said, you have never read it. You have to, you have to try. And so about 2015, <clears throat> I started reading Pratchett. Hmm. Um. I have only one book of, yeah, of the Discworld that I have not read yet. And wow. it is solely on the basis of, I don't want it to be over. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's about a book every two months then for the last six years. <laughs> um, I, I, I love them. Uh, I think Pratchett, for the longest time, <clears throat> if you were to ask me who my favorite writer was, I would have said Douglas Adams. Mm. So I think Adams... Uh, I, I love what he, I love his wordplay and his sense of humor and the complexity of the thoughts hidden behind ostensibly these very simple jokes. You know, if, if you think about the genius of infinite improbability leads directly to Dirk Gently, mm. right? These ideas are all, connected and beautifully connected and I, I don't think people realize how hard it is to write things that look completely accidental and aren't mm. um, and then I met Pratchett mm. and I was like oh my god no this this I mean Pratchett sort of nudged Adams down a step and but also in I, a way picked up the uh, baton from him in terms of you can see you know, yeah, you can see the interactions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he was unquestionably a genius. I think I don't differentiate between the canon, you know, canon literature and genre literature. Mm. Um, I think Pratchett's one of the greatest writers I've ever read. I would put Small Gods up against Lord of the Flies. Mm. You know, I would put feet of clay up against you know uh, uh connecticut yankee and king arthur's court i mean feet of, feet of clay is 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 a masterpiece it is one of the most devastating and scathing indictments on uh, on uh, of uh, 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 of one of the greatest crimes uh, 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 in humanity's history that continues to this very day and the word slavery is in it once, only once does the word slavery actually get used in 120,000 words of this story. Mm. Um, I think, I think you can learn almost everything you need to know about how to live reading Discworld. Okay. Well, and, and, I, and I really do believe that. And I say that also knowing that, look, the first three books are kind of rocky, <laughs> okay? Because he hasn't figured out what he's got yet. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But as soon as he realizes what he can do with what he's created, mm. you know, and it starts to turn at equal rights, mm. right? And at equal rights, what is that, the fourth book? Equal rights, he's already coming out swinging. It's in yeah. the damn title. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought you were going to say everything you could possibly need to know about life is in Discworld. Therefore, if I have these 40-odd novels on a desert island, they'll teach me how to survive in the wilderness. <laughs> no, but, but I will die happy.
Nice. I will die happy. I figure from Hawkeye, I can learn how to use a bow, right? So, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, I am. Um, it, 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 uh, like I said, to my eternal shame, I, I came to Pratchett late and I will always, always regret never, ever having had the opportunity to when passing the sky in yeah. his hat in the hall in the hotel to have not stopped and said, I love your books. Thank you for them. Oh, well. Thank you for putting these into the world. So in another life. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, thank you, Greg, for your fantastic uh, five choices. Um, and we're going to leave you with those choices of comics, your wasabi almonds, uh, your homemade yes. biscuits from dried stone fruits and your Pratchett. Yes. And uh, it's been an enormous pleasure talking to you. Thank uh, you today. so much. I, I really enjoyed it.